There's a story that grows out of the dark and turbulent days of the Vietnam War. A young man had returned stateside and called his parents. And of course, they were extremely happy just to hear his voice. It had been over a year since he'd been home, and they said, son, we can't wait to see you. When are you coming? He said, as soon as I can. He said, now, before I come, though, I need to tell you something. He said, I have a friend, and um, he is someone who has lost an arm and a leg, and uh, he is badly disfigured. He has no place to go and no one to help him. And I've invited him to come home with me and live with us. And the parents then said, son, we would love to meet him. But we are unable to take care of someone like that. It is just a burden we would not be able to deal with. And so while we would, we would love to meet him and have him here for a short time, he just cannot live here. And so the son said, okay, thank you. I love you. And hung up. Sometime later, a policeman called the parents. And he said, uh, I have a young man here who has lost an arm and a leg. And uh, all the papers indicate that he's your son. And I'm very sorry to tell you this, ma'am, but all indications are he has killed himself. Now, I don't know if that story is true or not. But one thing we all know for certain is how unloving and unmerciful our world can be sometimes. We don't always know how to define love, but we certainly feel it when it's not shown. In Matthew chapter 22 a lawyer came to Jesus and asked him this question in Matthew 22 and verse 36. He said, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? You notice he asked a singular question. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the foremost commandment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. We are told that rabbis counted over 600 laws and commandments from the Mosaic Code, positive and negative. And I don't know how many commandments there are, but I do know because of Jesus' teaching here and the other gospels that there are two commandments that stand head and shoulders above all the rest, and they center on the principle of love. Jesus said in answering his question that first and foremost, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is what the law says in Deuteronomy 6. And then he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so this vertical relationship comes first and foremost, and then second to that, all these horizontal relationships that we enter into in life, all God's laws depend on those two commandments. 
Jesus said so. And so if we miss that, then we've just missed everything. We have similar declarations that are made throughout Scripture. Galatians chapter 5, Galatians 5, in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then Paul said, against such things there is no law. If you're living this way, you're fulfilling everything God intended in the law. Again, in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus, I'm convinced, summarizes all of these different attitudes and qualities that Joe just read about in verses 1 through 16, he encapsulates it with this statement in Matthew 7 and verse 12. Matthew 7 and verse 12. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, another translation says. For this is the law and the prophets. In Romans 13, in Romans 13, I want us to see that this teaching saturates the Scripture. In Romans 13 and verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Now, clear statements like these, and they could be multiplied, forever establish God's highest priority for man, and that is love. Love is extremely important. But unfortunately, there are fewer words in the English language that are more misunderstood, misunderstood more misapplied, more abused, than the word love. On one side, we're talking about our enjoyment of ice cream with the word love. And then on another occasion, we're talking about our devotion to God with the same word. I'm certain we're not meaning the same thing. Sometimes people talk about falling into love or out of love. Love is not something we can fall into or out of. That's a product of our culture. There's nothing accidental or romantic about agape love. And it's certainly not sexual relations. And yet people use the term that way commonly. That's what the Bible calls fornication. It's a sin that must be repented of. Love is not simply good intentions or verbal assent. You know, it's nice to hear someone say, I love you. My wife says that to me every single morning. Every morning without exception. I say it to my grandkids. They say it to me commonly. It, it's wonderful to hear it more important and even better to see it, to see it in action. 
And that's what James intended when he said, don't be merely hearers, but doers. Have a nice day. Christianity doesn't put food on the table and it doesn't put clothing on someone's back. It's great to hear it. We need to more importantly prove it. And certainly that's what love is all about. Love is not temporary. It's not eroded by time or circumstances. Love never fails, Paul says. Love is not conditional. It's not performance-based, and that's the hardest thing of all. But neither does love require my approval of what you're doing. If I love God supremely, that means I, I want to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And if you're doing something that God hates, I can't approve of that. And I won't approve of that in love. What many people call love is not a 30-second cousin to what the Bible says is love. True love must be defined by its author, God. Look back at those passages that we just read a few moments ago. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew 7 and verse 12, where Jesus said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so the emphasis there is certainly stemming from the heart, but it ends up being active goodwill. You're doing something as a result of your care and concern for them. Remember, look, love your neighbors yourself. I'm, I'm supposed to be as concerned about his welfare as I am my own welfare. And so that's going to lead me to doing do unto others. Romans 13, Paul said it this way, remember verse 10, he said, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Again, it's active. God's word repeatedly, consistently shows us that agape love is known by the action it prompts. It's not feeling good, it's doing good. God so loved the world, he gave. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Now, statements like this and many others show us that love is active goodwill. Good also as defined by God. Love defined by God and good is defined by God. Here's the way Vine's Expository Dictionary defines it, and I think he did a really good job here. He said, love can be known only from the action it prompts. Christian love is not an impulse from feelings. It, it doesn't always run with the natural inc inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Love seeks the welfare of all and works no ill to any. I believe Vine's definition is consistent with all that we have read. Fair in his definition of the word agape says to be full of goodwill and exhibit the same to other people, to regard the welfare of another. William Barclay says, a deliberate principle of mind the power to love the unlovable, unconquerable benevolence. Good choice of words. C.S. Lewis, not a state of feelings, but of will. Active goodwill. 1 Corinthians 13, look over there, please, also provides an excellent description of love and action. 1 Corinthians 13. The first three verses there, Paul again shows the priority of love, not only in this chapter, but the entire letter. First Corinthians 13, verse 1, he says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy, know all mysteries, all knowledge, all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
And then verse 3, 1 Corinthians 13, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. The priority of love is Paul's main point here before he looks at the fruit of love in verses 4 through 7. Without love, Paul says, even if he spoke in the language of angels. Now, he didn't say that he did. He said, if I spoke in the language of angels but do not have love, it would just be noise to God. Without love, even having all knowledge, if we knew all things, it would mean nothing to God. Without love, Paul says, even great sacrifices, sacrificing your body, without love profits nothing in the eyes of God. That's how important love is. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, Paul associates both the action and the motive. And he shows us that both the action and the motive are inseparably connected. So while love prompts active goodwill, that, that goodwill must come from a heart of love. The very action being done is the person. It's who you are. Look at the fruits. There are some 16 fruits given here in verses 4 through 7. All of them are verbs. 16 verbs. Active goodwill. Verse 4, he says, love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Does not brag. Is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly, doesn't seek its own, is not provoked, doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love is known by the action it prompts but the action must be prompted by the character of Christ. And so in agape love, both the attitude and the action are inseparably connected. Agape love is patient because like Jesus Christ, you're patient. That's who you are in part. Agape love is kind because, like Christ, you're kind. Love is unselfish because, just as Jesus, we deny ourselves. Sixteen verbs showing love in action, but all sixteen are inseparably connected to the character of Christ. Both deed and motive are prompting this Christ-like behavior. I look forward to studying these fruits of love with you, Lord willing, next week. So where do we get this kind of love? This agape love is taught in the Bible. You're not born with it. You can't buy it. And you can't earn it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 teaches us that it comes only by the love of God. John said this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And so if we do not love one another, as God teaches, we don't know God. We're not born of God. We don't know God. The obverse would have to be true. There's nothing natural about Bible love, but that's the truly great thing about it, because this is how we truly know we're born of God, and we truly know God is by the love we have for one another. That's the, that's the problem, you see, as we read again this morning, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and many of the scribes had with their fellow man. They didn't love them because they had never experienced the love that comes from God. 
It was difficult for them, them to even think of extending mercy to their fellow man or on a horizontal plane because they didn't think of mercy coming from God in heaven. It's indeed difficult to show this if you've never known this. But because John says we're born of God, we truly know God and have actually experienced the love and the mercy of God, then we can take that love and mercy and we can extend it to our fellow man as well. That, that makes total sense, doesn't it? That's what John is saying here. You'll not be able to truly love others until you accept and receive God's love in your own life. And so John urges us, accept the love of God. It is his gift to you through his son, Jesus Christ. And then take this love that he has extended to you and extend it to other people. Think on these things, brethren. If you'd like to receive the love of God this morning in your life, please come as we stand and sing this song to further encourage that.